so we don't do retargeting and tracking and all these practices that essentially every other marketer, my you know previous self included, takes advantage of. I know that makes some marketers' heads explode. Why wouldn't you do this, right? It makes it makes everything easier, better, faster, cheaper, whatever. And we have declined partnering with some marketing related companies because they don't meet our own privacy standards. So yeah, it makes for the most challenging marketing role I've had in this respect. And things like attribution can be difficult. We've definitely been making progress along the way. When we think about attribution, we think about large or isolated campaigns that can provide large signals, model a projected baseline, and then look at that incremental lift. Sometimes in test and control geos, large ones, again, to protect privacy. I'm Eric Fulweiler, and this is Scratch, bringing you marketing lessons from the leading brands and brains rewriting the rulebook from scratch for the world of today. Hey, everyone. Super interesting conversation today with Christina Stanley, who is the VP of Marketing at DuckDuckGo, which is a search engine browser across really all platforms at this point. You probably have heard of them. They are very much a David in the category of Google with Chrome and Apple with Safari, the Goliaths of really the tech industry overall, but certainly search. And it is fascinating. It's something that we touch on in kind of a later chapter of the conversation, Christina's approach and her playbook and principles for being a David and taking on Goliath, because she also did this actually at Yelp, taking on Google, uh, where she was before DuckDuckGo. But actually where we start the conversation, which is fascinating for me, and there's so much good stuff in here, is actually talking about her background in CPG marketing. She started her career at Coca-Cola, she worked at Safeway, she worked at Del Monte Foods, and then she went into tech. And I love her perspective on kind of the transferable skills and the baseline foundational skills that helped to make her into the marketer that she is today and really put her on the CMO path. So we do dig in to the approach that she's taking with DuckDuckGo and how she's trying to market a business and a product that relentlessly adheres to their standards and their principles around consumer privacy and obviously Um, You know, the world of marketing in 2023 and 2024, that is not always front and center. And in some ways it's a disadvantage because she's not able to use all the tech and all the tactics that other marketers are able to. Um, But she's actually found a way to lean into it and make it a real opportunity and an advantage for the brand. So I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. I actually took a lot of notes um, as I was listening to Christina speak. I'm definitely going to go back and re-listen to it. Please enjoy my conversation with Christina Stanley of DuckDuckGo. Hey, Christina, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you? I am good. You're calling in from San Francisco, right? That's right. Yep. And in a, another example of just how small the marketing world is, on our prep call, we realized that we kind of sort of crossed paths back in the day when I was running the San Francisco office for Vayner and you were at uh, Del Monte. And I know we're going to talk about your background, but I do miss my San Francisco days. It is a special city for sure. Awesome. Well, really looking forward to the conversation that we have today. Like I said, when I reached out, you know, I'm just fast. I know that I learned a little bit in our prep call, but I'm fascinated to dive deeper into kind of the approach that you've taken, not just at DuckDuckGo, but also what you did at Yelp. Um, And already from our prep conversation, there's a couple of things that I've taken away from that. So I think it's going to be a really good episode. No pressure though, of course. Um, So To start the conversation, quick icebreaker that we ask every guest, can you tell us about one challenge or brand that you're passionate about right now and why? Yeah, the first one that came to mind, because I can see it right there, is Ruggable. It's, I think, the first washable two-piece rug. So the idea is if you have a spill, you rip off the top, you throw it in the wash, and you're good to go, Um, which was game-changing for me as a parent before having a kid I bought these like very expensive rugs. We don't eat in those rooms because we don't want to spill on them. Um, There's something we want to last for a long time. And I love how Ruggable just turned this upside down. And it's not fast fashion. It's like they're quality pieces that you're meant to keep. Um, But they're affordable and you're not scared to to mess them up. And uh, it's just a very different way of approaching something that has never been disrupted before. And I'm a big fan. It's one of those things where you hear about it and you're like, of course, why didn't this exist a long time ago? And one of those kind of like, 
I guess, product breakthroughs where, you know, I don't know how they got to that answer, but it's one of those things where it's like, you know, we talk a lot about like the jobs to be done methodology. It's like, what is the job that they are hiring? Especially as parents, I can totally relate. What is the job that we're hiring a rug for in our house? It is both to look nice and feel nice and ideally not to get ruined every day. Um, that's really cool. And what about from a marketing perspective? Like, how did you hear about them? Do you have any sense of what they're doing? That is a great question. Um, I, you know, I probably saw an ad online, but I couldn't exactly remember when or where. Um, and then it seems like one of those things that word of mouth has been really strong for them and that I'm starting to hear other folks talk about them and rave about them kind of a thing. I did a lot of research, too, because I was skeptical at first and you know, digging into some forums and finding those really early brand advocates raving about them. So, you know, I think they have a pretty strong following that's probably doing a lot of the marketing for them. Yeah. I could also see kind of paid influencers doing a lot for them as well. Like I think my wife who has um, a pretty big following on Instagram and she does some kind of influencer deals, but for the most part, it's just when she finds something interesting, she tells her audience about it. And that is just, you know, word of mouth is always the best marketing, um, especially if it's authentic. Cool. I'm definitely going to have to check that out. Definitely going to have to tell her about it as well. So DuckDuckGo, for those who either don't know or probably like me um, are not an active user, at least not right now. We'll see maybe at the end of the conversation, but know the name. Can you give an overview of uh, DuckDuckGo, where you're at as a business, where you're at as a brand before we dive into the interview? So DuckDuckGo was founded in 2008. We've been around for a while by our CEO, Gabriel Weinberg. And this is before the days of Snowden and Cambridge Analytica. And when the world was just starting to realize the scary and creepy power and surveillance of companies like Facebook and Google. And a few years after founding, Gabriel started to build out the team and established our company vision to raise the standard of trust online. Fifteen years later, that vision remains the same. We've built something that I think is pretty rare in tech, a company that actually protects user privacy, and we've done so profitably since 2014. So what exactly is DuckDuckGo? It's a browser that you download to your mobile and desktop devices. Unlike Chrome, though, the DuckDuckGo browser has privacy built in. So it comes with a private alternative to Google Search, which doesn't spy on your searches, and it blocks cookies and creepy ads, and there's no catch. It's free. We make money from ads, but they don't follow you around. Our tagline is privacy simplified. DuckDuckGo is comprehensive and seamless. It just works without having to know the technical details or deal with complicated settings. And this is combined with the very simple but critical promise laid out in our privacy policy. We don't track you. And is that, you mentioned privacy simplified and even just the way that you described it, like clearly you and I'm guessing some other people there have like done a lot of work to get that down to a super simple, clear, distinctive explanation of what it is. Um, was that was that a big part of kind of like the initial job that you had to do? Because I think we find and obviously DuckDuckGo is already at scale, but especially with a lot of the technology companies that we work with and startups and scale ups, there's so much there. And usually the product is super interesting and exciting, but getting it down to a one sentence explanation that everybody will understand, but is not kind of overly simplified is really hard. Was that one of the things that you had to tackle? Yeah, um, that was largely in place when I arrived, but continuing to mine that idea and figure out how to optimize the messaging. Because most folks uh, state that they want privacy online, right? Not a big surprise. But they feel like it's this insurmountable task. I don't even know how to begin. All the, I know these companies have my information. I'm powerless to do anything about it is often a misperception. And so part of what we're trying to do is our education and messaging is saying, look, it doesn't have to be difficult or complicated. It can actually be really simple. Great. Well, I know that we're going to dig into a little bit more about what you've done since you've gotten there with the brand and the messaging and the go-to-market. So we'll come back to that. But um, the first kind of chapter that I wanted to dig into with you is really actually talking about your background in CPG and then coming into tech. And this is something that I really believe, even though i did not have the opportunity to work at a big um, kind of CPG or in more of like a traditional marketing type role. But you talked in our prep call about how consumer packaged goods is such a good kind of training ground for marketers. And you talk about these, quote, transferable skills 
that you get as a CPG marketer, particularly within a big organization. So could you talk a little bit more about what those transferable skills are and then how you've found those valuable for you transitioning from CPG into tech? Well, my first roles in CPG were all about how to be really strong with data. Waist deep in databases, learning SQL, forecasting, modeling. I did not love that at first. I wanted to skip ahead to the fun, sexy part of marketing and advertising. But I'm now really appreciative of the skill set to be a really quantitative marketer. And I think that brings marketing a lot of legitimacy. The bigger CPG companies have the infrastructure to do extensive training, sometimes rotational programs. And in younger tech companies, sometimes you just have to figure it out for yourself as you go along. CPG teaches you things like what owning a P&L means, how to think through investment trade-offs, profitably grow the business, buy versus build, how to speak to senior management about the health of your business. All of these things are critical and highly transferable, no matter what type of vertical you're in. When I was at Del Monte, we had this monthly meeting nicknamed the barbecue because you are going to get grilled, which is a terrible joke. It's not mine. You're welcome to hate on it. But the idea behind the barbecue was that you are likely to get asked about a single metric on a single skew at a particular retailer. And you better know how to answer that question in front of the room of senior management. And it instilled in me in the importance of really knowing your business and being accountable for it. And then also, you may have heard of brand management described as a hub and spoke model. So the marketer is at the center and needs to know the language and how to influence all the different spokes, finance, product, user insights, all the different functions. It's the same in tech, probably even more so with more silos. And as a, uh, as a final side point I'll share with you, my husband has joked with me, look, you've sold milk, lucerne, Green beans, Del Monte, pure commodities. A green bean is a green bean, he would say. And if you can do that, you can market anything. I think that may have been a little gracious, uh, but I do feel like I started out in hard mode in some respects. It definitely taught me the value of a brand, right? When you're selling a commodity, all you have is a brand. And I don't think it would have been possible for me to have leadership roles at tech companies with nascent marketing functions without this experience from CPG. I love that. And um, some of what you talked about sounds cultural in a way, kind of like the barbecue, you're going to get grilled, you need to know everything. But also a big part of it, and for me, this is what I always observed, working with CPG businesses and also some of the other interviews that we've had. I'm thinking specifically of um, the CMO of Old Mutual Insurance, the largest insurance company in Africa, who came up through the rungs of P&G. And he talked about many of the same things that you did, because when you're a brand manager within Del Monte or P&G or Unilever or whatever, you're not just doing marketing. And in many ways, that's a small part of what you're doing. You're managing retailers, you're thinking about distribution, you're thinking about product innovation and research and finance and all those things. So yeah, I think that if I, for people listening who are kind of at the beginning, because I never went to marketing school or business school or anything like that. Uh, and certainly didn't have kind of the classical training, but it gives you like, that's such a good thing to try to aim for it. Obviously those jobs are pretty competitive, but I think if you can get in there, regardless of what you want to do in the future, it's such a good foundation in a way. So, um, you know, Del Monte, um, Coca-Cola, uh, Safeway, you had a lot of great experience. How and why did you decide to make the move to tech? And I think that was with Yelp, right? It was Yelp. And then to duck, duck, go. That's right. Uh, you know, it's funny because after spending all those formative years of my career in, in CPG, I was very adamantly um, would say things like, I'll never go to the dark side of tech, right? I had this vision of tech that marketing is an afterthought and that product and engineering just build something and throw it over the wall and say, figure out how to market it kind of a thing. Um, but it was through the help and encouragement of a friend and, um, I felt like there was this really unique right time, right place opportunity for me at Yelp where the company hadn't done paid advertising before. And brand awareness outside of major metro areas was really low. 
which is kind of hard to believe all these years later. And so they were looking for someone with that classical marketing training to come in and help influence the org, how to think about things like, you know, where should we advertise? What should a budget look like? Uh, what should an ROI be? Things, things like that. Um, and so it, it, you know, it was a little bit scary to move from the comfort of CPG and into tech, but I'm so glad I did it. And I'm now completely eating my words. When I went, I think my first focuses were actually not about marketing. It was more about things like working to build these strong cross-functional relationships to try to build some credibility for me in tech that I could, you know, chat with folks like in the product team and try to hold my own and understand what they were working on, build some trust versus just coming in and plowing through and saying, here's how we should do things, particularly because the company had not done marketing before. And I think a lot of the folks were adverse to doing marketing. We didn't even have product marketers. And so part of what I wanted to do was work to reframe marketing, not as a cost center, but as a growth driver to amplify all the great work that these teams like product and engineering had been doing. And so, at, you know, at Yelp, they had only been doing this grassroots, no budget marketing. Similar at DuckDuckGo, most of the growth in those early days was from really strong word of mouth. And in each instance, I saw an opportunity to take a brand with a clear product market fit to the next level to cross the chasm into the mainstream, to get the stereotypical your mom using it kind of a thing. And I felt like I could largely copy paste the playbook that I made from the early days at marketing at Yelp to the early days of marketing at DuckDuckGo. In each instance, there was a clear room to better understand the consumer, their wants and needs, translate that into better consumer focused messaging. And the approach for each was to just start with small wins right? Do some small, quick experimentation, which I was relieved and invigorated to find that can be done much, much quicker than CPG, right? CPG is like this big year-long product launch. And in tech, you know, you might just be able to ship something out the next day or the next week, kind of a thing. So show some quick wins. And when we started moving into a higher level investment at each company for things like TV, just do a few test and control DMings to start with right? Like start to get people comfortable with how to do marketing and these big levels of investment. And then above all, just be transparent with learnings and bring others into the process so they can feel invested in the outcome. And then going to DuckDuckGo, I felt very lucky to find an opportunity where the top company goal was a marketing goal. So when I joined, it was brand awareness to make DuckDuckGo a household name. And how amazing as a marketer, that I wasn't going to have to come in and go on a crusade to convince everyone of the importance of building brand awareness. It was already the goal that everyone in the company laddered up to. So that, you know, along with things like the growth trajectory and the values and mission of the company just made it super clear for me that this was going to be an amazing opportunity. There's so much good stuff in there. I feel like anybody kind of coming up the ladder as a marketer, just kind of go back and re-listen to that four or five times. That's probably a lot of what you need to know um, in order to get to the next level. I do want to double click on something. So you talked about reframing, I forget the exact words, basically reframing marketing from a cost center to a growth driver. And I think every marketer would love to be able to do that, particularly in today's market where we're all getting asked to do more with less or, you know, you know where, where things are. Um, how did you do that? Or what advice would you have for people listening that are trying to overcome that same challenge within their organization? Yeah, well, maybe easier said than done kind of a thing, right? Uh, I mean, a few things come to mind. One is finding those points of resistance, finding what teams or individuals they are, and working to uncover what's driving it, right? It might be something like lack of familiarity with marketing, or they may have got burned by another marketer in the past who wasn't a great peer. And I think the second step is being highly quantitative. Um, you know, marketing can get this bad reputation as, you know, being fuzzy and these creatives who just think about cool ideas all day long. But, um, you know, if you, if you have the receipts, so to say, you can demonstrate the effectiveness. You know, do something like a test and control experiment where you can show um, what happened in the absence of marketing, that can also be pretty powerful, right? Or to turn it off and to start to see sales drop type of a thing. Um, and 
to, you know, to go slowly and build, I think is the best way to do it, to get folks comfortable along the way. It's really interesting. It, um, a lot of what you're saying reminds me of how, you know, the big CPG businesses and kind of brand teams would approach solving a problem in a market. Like it's very uh, logical. It's very kind of customer centric. You know, you're focusing on what let's diagnose where the friction or where the gap in understanding actually is. It's very uh, data driven, quantified. So I'm just kind of pulling that out. It seems like kind of the going back to the first kind of chapter of this conversation that experience helped with because it's kind of like to, to sum it up for me, one of the things that I always think about particularly having been a CMO or for anybody who's a senior marketer, not an individual contributor, it is as much about the people around the work as it is the work that you need to do. And so it seems to me that kind of the experience that you had at, at uh, Del Monte and Coca-Cola and kind of in the CPG world, although I'm sure people can get this elsewhere as well, but seeking out those opportunities to learn how to solve the people problems internally as much as externally in order to set marketing up correctly in the organization to be able to do the job that the business wants it to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, having a strong team and investing that time in hiring will save you more time than any other possible action you can take, right? Understanding that your team is aligned with your vision and they're thinking of new creative ways to approach things all the time and that you can just count on them to get things done and not have to micromanage. Um, that just makes it all so much easier, right? And I feel so lucky to be in that situation right now. So shifting gears, let's talk about something that was not as easy, or at least on the outside seems not as easy. You step into this marketing lead role at DuckTuckGo, and especially probably at the time that you joined, what you had to do in a privacy, um, privacy being core to the product, customer-centric business, privacy simplified, everything that you talked about that was already in place, in many ways, you didn't have many of the pages of the playbook that other marketers did in the sense that you couldn't track people, you couldn't retarget people. And while that might be better from a change we want to see in the world standpoint, if you drill down to day to day, what's it like to be a marketer and try to acquire users and retain users and all that stuff, you know, you had at least one hand tied behind your back in a way. So is that how you thought about it? Or was it more about kind of, hey, let's lean, let's leverage this and lean into it and take the opportunity? I'm sure there was some of that. But in the early days, and, and maybe even up to right now, how do you approach marketing a product where privacy is core to what it is and you're not able to take the approach that many other tech marketers would? Yeah, I think I felt like it a little bit of both, right? It's a bit of a frustration, but it's also potentially an opportunity and a way to differentiate that could go, um, you know, if not to the average consumer, then to some more tech savvy or passionate ones in that space, as well as recruiting. Right. So to back up a little bit and to clarify, our marketing principles reflect the same privacy ethos of our core product. So we don't do retargeting and tracking and all these practices that essentially every other marketer, my you know, previous self included, takes advantage of. I know that makes some marketers heads explode. Why wouldn't you do this, right? It makes it makes everything easier, better, faster, cheaper, whatever. And we have declined partnering with some marketing-related companies because they don't meet our own privacy standards. So yeah, it makes for the most challenging marketing role I've had in this respect. And things like attribution can be difficult. We've definitely been making progress along the way. When we think about attribution, we think about large or isolated campaigns that can provide large signals, model a projected baseline, and then look at that incremental lift, sometimes in test and control geos, large ones, again, to protect privacy. It also makes estimating a lifetime value for payback hard because we don't even know how many mouths we have. That's another one that's hard for marketers I talk to to wrap their heads around. We don't have login accounts. We don't track individual users. We do know how many searches happen, but we don't technically know if that's coming from one person or 100 million people. So we use a lot of sophisticated guessing, I'll call it, surveys, triangulating data points to estimate those numbers. We are actually very data-driven and build lots of models despite these data limitations, right? The, the models just have a few more assumptions 
than they would have for me working at previous companies. So all of this has led us to invest most of our budget in traditional marketing, which might sound surprising for a tech company. But I have this hypothesis that there's a more even playing field in non-digital channels where all these retargeting and tracking practices aren't so prevalent. So we have a current TV campaign in the U.S. and U.K., and it's been our most effective channel. We're not running radio at the moment, but at one time we were the number two radio ad buyer in the U.S. We are in digital, but not at the scale I would like yet. We're always looking for new privacy-respecting ad platforms, particularly with paid for performance or low CPIs. I am starting to um, help the education, help the, the organization think about it as a portfolio approach. So we know there are channels that will be highly successful and profitable, but we can't keep all of our eggs in one basket. You know, as well as TV is doing for us, we need more, we need diversification. And we need to continually increase reach and increase the types of demographics that we're reaching. So on the other end of the spectrum, there should be a test to learn bucket. And most of those eggs in that particular basket might fail at scaling profitably. But if just a couple work out in this portfolio approach and they scale, that could be the jackpot. Um, the other thing I'm trying to instill is that that bucket should be isolated in terms of ROI measurement. It should be more forgiving and not pull down the overall marketing ROI by combining channels at these very different maturities. So a lot of it for us is, you know, still in the experimentation and exploration days, um, all, you know, all in the goal of, of scaling profitably. It's interesting. We just recorded about a week ago, although I think it's probably going to come out before this episode, this conversation with you gets released, an insight show, having done now 70 interviews with CMOs and senior marketers, what are the key takeaways? And number one for me, just because I thought it was the most interesting, it was the thing that you there's some stuff in there that you would expect to hear from everybody, you know, focus on the customer, constant innovation, et cetera. But this idea of having a test and learn bucket, a 70, 20, 10 framework, it was, was, was so prevalent in so many of these conversations that I had to call it out as number one. So it's really interesting to hear you have taken that and applied it as well. And I really like the approach of forgiving the results or the data on that bucket, because you're right. It's not about, it's there for a different reason than the 70% or the channels that you know work. And so if what measures is what matter, if, if what you measure is what matters, then you shouldn't be approaching them in the same way. I wanted to come back to um, one thing that you said about, you feel that the playing field is more level in these, let's say above the line, uh, more analog channels. What did, what did you mean by that? I'm curious to, to double click on that. Yeah. So in digital, obviously, it's so easy to hone in on exactly who you want to talk to, right? You know, a 27-year-old woman who lives in this city and loves dogs and, and bought these three things from your website already, right? And so I feel like when we are going to buy advertising inventory on some of these sites, all of these types of folks have been snapped up, at, you know, at least at the prices that we're willing to pay. And we get kind of the the leftover inventory, right? The potentially uh, less likely to convert type of consumers um, or less engaged or maybe even bots for that matter. And um, it, it makes it difficult for us to try to reach folks in a privacy respecting way on these platforms. Whereas something like linear TV, you know, everyone is essentially broadcasting the same message to the same group of folks within a particular ad pod. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. So the way that you go about buying the media is the same as everybody else, whereas in digital, it's not. You're at a disadvantage for the tactics and tech that you won't use based on the principles of the business. That makes total sense. How do you approach measurement for these kind of offline channels? You know, radio, for example, you're the number two advertiser in radio. How do you know whether or not that's working? You know, you said you're a very data-driven company. So how do you approach measurement in channels that aren't as easy to measure at least with direct response types of metrics. Yeah, so it's all internal. We don't use any third parties right now. I'd, you know, I'd love to find an MMP, for example, um, but none of them has, have met our privacy standards so far. So we have uh, dedicated data scientists to the marketing team, which has really been a game changer 
from me being the person that was initially <laughs> doing all of all of the analysis, you know, which was good enough at the time, but certainly not as sophisticated as it could be in terms of starting to build out a media mix model and these types of things. Um, in the early days, and, and to some extent even now, the what makes it challenging for us is we typically need to do these campaigns in isolation to really get a great understanding of performance. So we will go look at historicals. We will model out what the expected baseline is. And then assuming that there's no other activity can generally attribute these incremental installs to the campaign, particularly if it's done in you know a testing control environment where we feel really confident about that incrementality. And so we assess that regularly throughout the life of any campaign. For TV, for example, you know it may lead us to adjust things like the mix of 15 and 30s or, you know, a flighting pattern or how much we want to lean in on network versus cable, all these types of decisions we're making throughout the life of the campaign so that we can try to reach optimization before we get to the end. Um, But in terms of anything like understanding performance at an individual level, that's completely off the table. Um, It's all very anonymized and in aggregate, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, a million installs kind of a thing. It is interesting to hear how data-driven the company is, um, knowing that there's a lot of customer data that you can't use. Um, and I'd just be curious maybe to come back to what what was the creative side or what is the creative side of what you've done? Like a lot of what we talked about and it seems like, and you talked about in the very early days, kind of having to learn SQL and getting really deep into kind of data and analytics and all that stuff. But um, what is the creative side of what you're doing now look like because especially for those kind of big above the line channels um that's really important as well so how do you approach creative yeah so increasingly we are bringing it in-house um we in our last campaign we did not work with an agency and um for, for the production process we essentially managed the production and then outsourced as we wanted and this is working really well for us because uh quite frankly we like to micromanage all the different aspects um, and it's also, it also seems faster not having a middle person. So the process side of it is continually evolving. The piece that I'm most hungry for is just filling that funnel with really, really great ideas. Uh, and from there, it's easy for us to run and execute. So, you know, in general, what we are most focused on is communicating this privacy simplified idea. And we are not afraid to very directly say why we are better than Google and Chrome. So in our current TV ad, it shows a side-by-side experience, how Google and Chrome are plagued with creepy trackers and how DuckDuckGo is a seamless, refreshingly private experience. And our last TV ad really got people talking. We licensed the song Every Breath You Take by the police and changed the lyrics to things like every search you make, every click you take, I'll be watching you. It showed a guy in seemingly a Google shirt literally leering over the shoulder of someone searching on Google. We had a lot of fun making that one. So, you know, we want to be bold. We want to be attention grabbing. But we also want to back it up with education and what I think are clear, compelling reasons to switch. It's difficult to fit in all the messaging that we need to in, say, 30 seconds, right? It's not just talking about a new flavor of soda. We're trying to communicate this this new brand. It's about privacy. There's a browser, but it's also a search engine. And, you know, all of these things are kind of complicated and there's not a perfect analogy for it. So what we've been finding is that in moving our goals from awareness toward the bottom of the funnel, where folks are getting stuck is in that, call it interest bucket, where they say, yep, like I'm really interested. I'm going to download in the next two weeks, but they don't. And what we've been finding with research is that they just need a little bit more education to get over the hump, a little bit, you know, better understanding of what DuckDuckGo is and why they should use it. And so we've been trying to message things in our advertising, like help people understand that the typical online experience is as if someone is following you around and making a massive detailed profile about you. These profiles can be used in discrimination for housing, finance, healthcare, jobs, as an everyday example, you could be charged higher prices for a flight based on your profile. I saw this just a couple of days ago, comparing flights to New York in different browsers. 
And then also helping people understand that incognito mode is not actually private and it just deletes the information on your physical computer. It does nothing to stop Google from saving your searches and browsing history and then adding them to this profile they keep on you. In terms of reasons to believe, from the point of view as a marketer, thankfully we have a lot to talk about. So that makes my job a little easier. So for example, things like the DuckDuckGo browser blocks creepy ads that follow you around the web. You know, you searched for something last week and now you see an ad for it on a different site. Or maybe it was your partner who shopped for, say, an engagement ring, but now you're seeing the ad because you have the same IP address, all that kind of creepy stuff. We have Duck Player, which is a feature that lets you watch YouTube videos without the privacy invading ads. We, um, We also have something that I love. You know, those relatively new, really annoying cookie consent pop ups. And it feels like an IQ test trying to figure out which way the options should be toggled. Yep. Whenever possible, DuckDuckGo. And everybody just presses accept. Right. Like, it's like, I can't even navigate this. Why try? So what I love is that DuckDuckGo, whenever possible, just picks the most private setting, chooses those options, closes the pop-up without you ever having to see it. And then the big one that we, um, we spend a lot of time talking about, I'm continually surprised just how much we have to reinforce, is that we're free. Like, I feel like we have to scream free from all of our advertising. Most people have a hard time understanding it at first. They say, if DuckDuckGo protects your privacy by not tracking users, how can it possibly be free? What's the catch? Well, what we try to communicate is there is no catch. DuckDuckGo makes money from search ads, just not the creepy kind. If you search for cars, you get an ad about cars. And those ads know nothing about you or your search history. And so the creative challenge we really have is, you know, making something interesting and memorable but cramming in all this information, or at least prioritizing the most important pieces of information so that folks can understand just how different the experience is versus, say, a Google or a Chrome. I think there's a couple things that I would take out of that because, you know, one, you're not starting from scratch. It's not really a fair fight. It's not like someone standing in the grocery store and choosing between, you know, that can of pineapple or that can of pineapple. It's... Google and Safari, Apple, and, you know, they're the default for many people. And you know, there's a whole antitrust case about it now. Many people are there. And as we all know, as marketers and just human beings, it's really hard to get people to change unless they've got a real problem with how things are going right now. But I think to the private privacy thing, while it's more of a conversation now, I think a lot of people, you know, probably just accept it or don't understand it to the point about those pop-ups, which I think are just ridiculous because nobody really understands. I think they're the right intent, but probably the wrong execution. Nobody really understands what's going on. So it's always hard to get people to change. It's even harder to get people to change when it's a complicated technical thing where, you know, the understanding of how and why this stuff works the way it does is probably not there for a lot of people. But I really liked what you said. You actually said something in the prep call that stuck with me and I made a note about it where you talked about how product understanding is where people get stuck. And what you did is you, quote, stripped back the messaging so people get it. And hearing you talk about it now, you you try to cram everything in there, but I would say you, you you can't get everything in there. You can't get all those messages in there. But it sounds like what you've done is there are, you always talk about functional benefits and emotional benefits. And you've taken the functional benefits and created a very emotional story to tell people. Because as we all know, even though we like to deny it, or not admit it, as human beings, we are more spurred to change by our emotions than our rational thought process. And so just the way that you've kind of manifested the brand and some of these campaign examples that you talked about, to me at least, I see a very clear, these are the functional RTBs. This is back to what you said about how you approach driving change internally in the organization around marketing. Let's diagnose where the problems are. Let's take a data-driven approach, start small, test to figure out how we can actually change perception in the way that we want. So there's a lot of really good stuff in there. What I want to talk about um, for the last couple minutes that we have, and I think we've touched on this already, and I think it's very much kind of a a theme of the episode, at least for me. I had it down here as David versus Goliath, um, which is maybe a little bit dramatic, but it's true. I mean, you know, a year ago, DuckDuckGo passed 100 billion searches, but you still have 0.73% of the market share globally. I know that it's higher in the US, two and a half or three percent. I've seen a couple different numbers out there, but still certainly a David to the Goliath that is Google and Apple. And obviously the experience that you had at Yelp 
was very similar, a David taking on a Goliath in a separate but related industry. So maybe it's just kind of summing up a lot of what you've talked about, um, because I think a lot of the answers are in there, at least for me. But if you have to think about like the core principles or the playbook, as it were, for how you market a David in a category that's dominated by Goliaths, what would those kind of answers be from your experience? Well, at the highest level, uh, you know, outside of DuckDuckGo or anything I've worked on, you know, I'd probably steal a page from Malcolm Gladwell. And I would say it's unconventional tactics, right? You're not going to beat the Goliaths using the playbook they created. You need to use your own strengths. And as an underdog, you can take more risks, right? The large incumbents have so much more to lose. And so by nature are more risk averse. And, you know, I particularly saw this in CPG, right, where a timeline for development costs so many millions of dollars in a year and you're paying paying slotting fees to the retailers. And if you have a failure in a product launch, you lose credibility, not to mention just, you know, this huge sunk cost that you put into it. Right. And so being able to be the underdog and be more nimble, this is where, uh, you know, here lies the great opportunity. Right. So in the case of something like DuckDuckGo, again, I think it's coming down to not being afraid to be very pointed about how we understand the landscape to be and how Google is doing a disservice to consumers and what we can offer for free to make their experience and frankly, their lives better. Um, And to try, you know, some approaches that maybe others are doing, whether it be channels that others aren't activating or a different way to think about creative, um, particularly because we are a little bit constrained in terms of things like, you know, the data side of things or targeting just forces us to be a little bit more creative and think outside the box a little bit more. Uh, I think there's so much in there. And yeah, I think that that, you know, we talk about here at Rival, sharp elbows. What are our sharp elbows in the industry? Because in many ways, you know, we're you know, well, we're still small, very, very, very small, David, in the world of Goliath consultancies and agencies. Um, you know, we really think that things need to get done differently compared to traditional consultancies and traditional agencies and things like that. And it's kind of like, it's a bit of a thing that I keep coming back to because it's easy just to kind of like, I don't know if it's default or digress just into kind of like rolling things forward, but you really need, you really do need to make sure that that's as sharp as possible in order to cut through. So, there's good stuff in there for everybody listening, but I've got a couple takeaways and fear. And I think there's a couple things that we can take from this episode for our own David and Goliath journey. So Christina, uh, this has been great. I really appreciate it. And it's definitely one that I'm going to go back to and listen to again. Before I let you go, are you up for a quick lightning round of questions? Of course. Let's do it. So first marketing job that you ever had. Coca-Cola. I'm, pr- I'm pretty lucky that I'm able to say that's the first marketing job. Pretty spectacular. That's awesome. What's the best piece of career advice you've ever received? It's a quotation from Maya Angelou that goes something like, people will remember what you said or did. They will remember how you made them feel. I know this definitely rings true for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can think of... I saw that on somebody's LinkedIn yesterday. Oh, really? Yeah. It's, um, I mean, I think it's quite popular, but maybe not often applied to, you know, management or the career side of things as often. I can think of times where I worked with folks and maybe I don't even remember their name, but I certainly remember how they made me feel. And so I, I really try to instill this as a leader and a teammate, you know, letting folks know that, that I care and that I'm in this with them. I love that. There's, there's something to how that applies to brands as well, how you make people feel the emotional benefit that we talked about earlier. Um, But moving on, what is the best brand campaign that you've seen recently? So just last week, I saw that Walmart created a Hallmark Channel-esque, like two dozen episode holiday rom-com, a bit unexpected for Walmart. They're each just a few minutes long to, you know, capture our short digital attention spans. But what's really clever is you can shop all the outfits, all the makeup, the furniture, hundreds of items from either the Walmart site or if you're watching on TikTok, the shoppable video ads. So, you know, I confess I have not watched the wrong cons. <laughs> um, you know, that's a lot of time. But, uh, you know, just double clicking into them and the site, I think that it's 
really interesting, potentially very well executed, you know, a clever idea that kind of harks back to the original days of the soap opera. And I would love to see the performance results. I love it. We, um, I don't know if you saw that uh, Chevrolet ad that I think it was, it might've been for holidays. It could have been for Thanksgiving, but anyway, it's like this long two minute thing about a grandmother with Alzheimer's and all that stuff. And somebody posted it and we have this um, kind of CMO WhatsApp group, which we should definitely get you involved in. And my comment to it, it's was, it's amazing what brands can do when they try to make good content and not ads. And I'm guessing kind of the, the rom-com, you know, short series from Walmart fits in that bucket as well. Um, all right, two more. What is one marketing tool that you can't live without? Well, you're probably not surprised after everything I've said that we don't really use third-party marketing tools. We rely on homegrown privacy protecting solutions, which we truly cannot operate without. But if that's too big or not relevant, I'd say the thing that I can't live without as a marketer is any way that I can talk to or learn from consumers. Qual, quant, friends and family, like whatever you need to do to understand the consumer's wants and needs. I think this was cemented in me in my CPG days and just standing there observing people shopping in the grocery store can be super eye-opening, right? To see a consumer in the element. And it's important to remind yourself that they're not thinking about your brand even for a fraction of the time that you are. And for those who haven't worked in CPG brands or haven't worked for agencies that work with CPG brands, that's a real thing. That's a real thing that we do is actually go shopping with people, walk up to them in a grocery store and say, hey, can I watch you shop and understand what you're doing? But I think being on the front lines, like even if you're in a tech company and you do mostly digital, how do you recreate that? that understanding and that proximity and that empathy of literally standing there and following somebody through a supermarket and understanding how and why they make the purchase decisions that they do. Christina, thank you so much. Fantastic episode. I really appreciate your time. Um, hopefully we'll be able to continue the conversation in another episode at some point, but it's great to be connected. Likewise, really enjoyed our chat. Thank you. Scratch is a production of Rival. We are a marketing innovation consultancy that helps businesses develop strategies and capabilities to grow faster. If you want to learn more about us, check out wearerival.com. If you want to connect with me, email me at eric at wearerival.com or find me on LinkedIn. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe, share with anyone you think might enjoy it, and please do leave us a review. Thanks for listening and see you next week.